Last week, I was asked to do a lunch and learn session for a marketing team who wanted to know more about verbal branding and how language can create a powerful effect for their brands. In particular, we talked through why a brand's tone of voice is much more than just tone of voice. And after that session, a couple of people said, do you have this filmed? Which I didn't. So I've very quickly done this to camera for them and for anyone else who would like to understand a bit more around how language has a really powerful effect for brands. So there are two parts. In part one, which is this part, uh, I'm gonna show to you, prove to you why um, that you can consider yourself a very skilled forensic linguist in that subject where perhaps only 1% of students uh, even study it, which is linguistics, you seem to be born intuitive great at it. And then I'll go on to talk about how uh, language allows us to be such great linguists, in particular, of course, brand language. And towards the end of part one, I'll leave you on a cliffhanger as we try and work out what on earth language has been doing for two brands, Mini and Ferrari, which allows us to instantly understand one was Mini's tone of voice and the other was Ferrari's tone of voice. And I'll ask a small favour at the end of part one as well. In part two, we go into a lot more detail, still only 10 minutes, but a lot more detail around the three different levels of a brand voice and how they need to be consistent. So let's start. On this side, you'll see a piece of copy, which you might not be able to read, but don't worry, I'll cut the video and uh, show, it up, show it to you up close. On this side, there's another piece of copy, which again, you might not be able to read, but don't worry, I'll uh, cut the video and show you that piece of copy up close. But both pieces of copy are from car brands, two different car brands, but both pieces of copy are talking about how their car corners. So there's no imagery here. There's no uh, font, clearly, because I've written it by hand. Uh, there's really nothing to tell you which brand was which. In fact, I've called one brand X and the other brand Y, or the other way, other way around this time. So I'd like to give you 30 seconds. And when I cut away to the um, copy, you have a look at them and just make a quick guess. Which one is Mini talking about their car cornering and which one is Ferrari talking about their car cornering? Are you ready? Let's go. Okay, so you had 30 seconds, and if you're at home and you think you made a decision, intuitive decision with your skilled, in, amazing forensic linguistic skills, you've worked out that one piece of copy is Ferrari talking about how their car takes a corner, and the other is Mini talking about how their car takes a corner. So which did you think was which? Put your hand up at home, no one will know. If you thought this was Mini's copy and you thought this was Ferrari's copy. And put your hand up if instead you thought that this was Ferrari's copy and this was Mini's copy, in which case you're right. I have never found anyone that thought this was actually Ferrari's copy and this was Mini's copy. When I ask a group why, how can they be so sure? How in 30 seconds without any visual imagery, any color, any, anything else, that they can be so sure one is Mini and one is Ferrari just from the language? Uh, the group would normally throw out some comments. So I'm going to cut the video again, and I'm going to write up some of the comments which I typically hear. Some of the comments that I'll often get in a workshop, you can find that they split up into three different categories. Uh, this is how the workshop session panned out last time I did it. There were some comments, some people picked up on words from the copy like high curves, and they were saying this is an example of technical language, very jargon heavy language. Someone else picked up on how Mini, they knew it was Mini's copy, intuitively they knew it was Mini's copy, because Mini would seem to be the right kind of people, brand, to be using short, simple sentences, uh, whereas Ferrari had these very long 20 word sentences. 
Um, and generally, in one workshop, there's always um, one car nut, only one car nut, and they will say, Mini doesn't do a V12, and they're absolutely right. But that's the only thing in the whole copy which depends on you having a knowledge of cars. So that, I put all of those into one area, all of those words. I think of another area here, um, and people will often say, oh, the Mini's copy seem to be much more fun. Absolutely right. Um, and then some people will say there seemed to be a bit of a difference between uh, Ferrari's copy, which seemed to be very performance, kind of talking about performance, or seemed to be very interested, or seemed almost to be a performance in itself, whereas Mini's copy seemed to be very playful. Uh, and then finally, in the last session, someone said, well, you know, the thing is about the uh, Ferrari's copy is it's straightforward, baffling. So those words all seem to fall into one of their own categories. And there seems to be a, a final third category. And uh, someone said, it's not so much the word go-kart, but the, the whole feel of, of what Mini seems to be in Mini's copy seems to be about go-karting. You know, it just has that, uh, someone said fun to drive, someone else said it, oh, they're fun to drive, and that's really what the copy for Mini seems to be coming out about. It's just fun, and they seem like fun people. Someone else said that Ferrari's copy seems to be, not the exact words, not the tone, but it seems to be justifying the huge, uh, the high price point. And someone else said that Ferrari's copy seems to be very future focused. And I think, they're, I think they're absolutely right. And I don't know what you came up with when you had a little bit of time to scribble down some thoughts about what was in the copy. Remember, it's just a copy that allowed you to understand one was Mini and one was Ferrari. Which is amazing, really, when you think about it, that language, just 100 words, could tell you that. Because we know that uh, there are many other elements that a brand can play with to make their brand seem very differentiated, very engaging. Um, you can spot a Ferrari from a mile off. You can often hear it from a mile off. And when it gets closer, you can see the, the, the dialectic almost of its particular curves. And of course, of course, if you're very up close, you'll be able to see the uh, prancing horse on the logo. And similarly, you know, if a mini drives past me now outside the office, you, you might hear that bubble, bubble, pop of the exhaust system, uh, the sound of the exhaust system. And clearly a Mini has a particular shape, which really hasn't changed that much since uh, Sir Alec Isagonis sketched it on the back of a napkin. Um, and again, up close, it, you might see some of the little brand winks. Like if you look at the back of a Mini, you'll see the tail lights are half Union Jacks. So we know there are lots of physical things you can do, the shape of a Mini. We know that there are a lot of kind of audible things you can do. Uh, the sound of a mini and you know when you're in communications in more traditional communications clearly you know the layouts the color the imagery tell you that this is a mini or this is a Ferrari and even in the customer experience which is you know part of the bigger brand uh, I think if you go into a mini showroom you often find the people the salespeople wearing jeans and fleeces very relaxed having a chat I don't know what it's like going into a Ferrari sales room but I imagine that they're wearing suits, maybe even Italian suits. So language, which is really just marks on paper, which is just noises in the air, also has this great power because in just a hundred words, you are immediately able to show your for forensic linguistic skills and say, this is Ferrari, this is Mini. And when we look into the language, what is it? What's telling us? So there are the, there is this group of words, Technical words for Ferrari, a lack of jargon for Mini, uh, words like hikers for Ferrari, but um, Mini's using short, simple sentences. Ferrari's using these great big, long, complicated sentences. There's another, another group of words which are around, you know, fun, performance, playful, baffling. That's how people in the workshop described it. And there's a final group of words, not the exact word go kart, but what people are suggesting is coming out of the copy is this. Fun to drive, uh, justifying the high, high price point. Seems like it comes from people uh, who are future focused. So my question to you is, and this is kind of the end of part one, this is the cliffhanger. How would you describe this group of words? 
And how would you describe this group of words? What are they all an example of coming out of the copy? And finally, on the third group, how would you describe them? So have a think about that. And if you want to join me for part two, that's the small favour I was going to ask. Please join me for part two, where all will be revealed on how language works on three levels, what those different groups of words are, and why having a very clear definition of your brand voice, much more than just say, this is our tone of voice, these are our four adjectives that describe our brand voice. Having a much more comprehensive definition of your brand voice uh, allows you to uh, manipulate your brand language to make it much more differentiated, much more engaging, and much more valuable but also it gives your writers the tools to allow them to, to kind of go ahead and write copy much more effectively. Okay, thanks for listening to part one and I look forward to seeing you in part two. Welcome back everyone, this is part two where you get closure and hopefully I explain why a brand's tone of voice is much more than just its tone of voice. So where do we leave part one? In part one, we had words like this in one group. They were jargon words like high curves or Minnie's choice not to involve itself with technical jargon. Uh, but someone also picked up that there were lots of short words, for example, in Minnie's copy and simple sentences. And it was only the V12, which was a very car specific uh, thing, which would have let you know which was a Mini and a Ferrari, everything else came through the different elements of the language that the writers were playing with. In the middle group, we had uh, words, the, the things that people were picking up on were things like, well, this seemed to be fun or accessible, or Ferrari seemed to be all about performance in their language, many about being playful, uh, and someone talked about baffling language. In the third group, we had someone saying, well, Ferrari want to reference their Formula One heritage. Someone said Mini's about go-karting uh, and being fun to drive. Someone else said that Ferrari seemed to be justifying their high price point. And there was a lovely comment at the end about uh, Ferrari's language seemed to be very future driven. So I asked the question, what's, what's, how would we categorize this uh, group of elements or these clues coming out of the language that helped you instantly say that's a Mini and that's a Ferrari in language just as quickly as you could in the shape of a car from a distance or the sound of a car. What was in this second group that allowed you to say uh, what, what, how would we categorise those elements and how would we categorise the third elements? Someone very nicely said these seem to be adjectives and I would agree with that. Someone said this seemed to be structure. This first group seemed to be structure or maybe grammar. And we uh, started speaking like da uh, Daleks uh, as the bandwidth crashed uh, for this third group. So what I was going to try and get you to um, suggest yourselves, because you were very good and you knew all this, was that this was, yes, it was structure and it was grammar and it was particular words and I would describe this almost as the nuts and bolts, um, the kind of ground level, the very tangible concrete things that many and Ferrari's writers were choosing in their language. So that's nuts and bolts. At the other end, this thing about Formula One heritage, just fine high price point, future driven. This wasn't about the individual model of the car. It certainly wasn't about cornering. It seemed to be much more about who Ferrari was or who Mini was or what their world view was or even what they stood for and what their values were. So for me, this is much more about the brand voices narrative. And so what's, what about this middle group? Yes, they're fun, accessible, performance, 
Yes, they are adjectives. And that's where the tone of voice actually is. So I th that's why I think that language works on three levels. You have a guiding narrative for the voice, and that directs what content, what you want to write about, and the angle that you want to take on it. So as far as Mini is concerned, what they want to write about is go-kart handling, it being fun to drive. And they seem to be kind of fun people. In contrast, Ferrari want to talk about being um, Formula One, high priced, everything else. Their narrative seems to be, we are Formula One, Formula, blah, blah, Formula One like sports cars. Now, the way that Go, uh, the way that MIDI chooses to execute that narrative of being go-kart and fun to drive is with language which is playful, which has a total value of being playful, and language which is fun. How does Ferrari, in contrast, deploy that narrative in its tone of voice? It, Ferrari deploys it by having a tonal value which is much more about baffling or highfalutin or performance -y kind of language. And how do those brands continue that narrative, that tonal value, down in the nuts and bolts? Well, you know, the nuts and bolts are that Ferrari will choose technical words, and it will, it will write incredibly long sentences. If you try and read out Ferrari's uh, sentence or that, that piece of copy I gave you, if you try and read it aloud, you actually have to have, I think, an actor's control of your breathing to get all the way through it. Some of the sentences are so long. In contrast, Minnie's copy had sentences which were just three words long. So yeah, absolutely. Structure, shorter words, avoiding technical words. That's all of this stuff, and that's what I call the nuts and bolts. And that's why I think it's really important to understand how language for a brand works on three, what I would call three levels. It's almost like at 10,000 feet, you've got the narrative. Setting out the area that your brand is in, in your language, in the choice of things you write about and the angle you take on them. And then coming down a level to 1,000 feet, this is where you get the tonal values coming out. The, the kind of playfulness or the performance mentality in, in, the, in the language, in the tonal values. What kind of person does it sound like is saying that? And then you get the nuts and bolts, the ground level choices. Now, the reason I think it's really important is that if you only have your tone of voice, your brand's tone of voice, defined as a set of four adjectives, human, friendly, warm, and approachable, well, they're terrible adjectives to start off with anyway, because which brand would want to be inhuman, hostile, um, and robotic? You know, if you've only got four adjectives, which might be your tone of voice, what you're missing is giving guidance to your writers on the narrative, on who we are as a company and the, and the worldview we take. Because if you've got those, then almost anything your writers choose to write about or the angle they take on it will basically be right. And it will naturally inform the tone of voice and the adjectives. You need to define your adjectives. You need to define your tone of voice. I think that's really important. But don't just have four adjectives. Really unpack those adjectives. So we worked with Vauxhall car brand. And one of the things they said was, Oh, we like humour. And we said, that's great, we like humour. They said, no, no, we like British humour. And we said, okay, that's really good guide for your tone of voice, but let's take it a step further. What kind of British humour do you like? Because there's Frankie Boyle at uh, one end of the spectrum, and there's maybe, um, suddenly my mind's gone blank on the other, there's the comedian who's on uh, every Saturday night, but who's a much more family-friendly, gentle comedian. They're both example, great examples of British humour. So the more precisely you can define your adjective, the more help you're giving your writer. And there's a reason why you want to do this, of course, which is it's much better to be signing off version one or version two 
of some brand language rather than version 12 or version 20. But also defining your nuts and bolts, this ground level stuff, which will be consistent with your tone of voice and will be consistent with your narrative. Defining your nuts and bolts is really great because then you can have, uh, we work with Fred Perry, for example, and they said, one of the things we want to be really clear on is we say shop, not store. Because store is American and Fred Perry as a brand is very British. So defining that helps your writers write it correctly first time. And it means that hopefully you're signing off version one, version two, not version 20. But also it gives right, um, if you're defining this properly, comprehensively, you're giving your writers lots of help because my inclination is to write incredibly long sentences. But if I see someone's brand language guidelines and it says we write in short sentences which are easy to understand, then okay, I know that I won't write any sentences which are longer than 10 words. And so every element of the brand language then will seem very strongly resonant of that brand. Because for example, Minnie's writers know we write in short, simple sentences, we avoid jargon, we know that when it comes to it, we're going to have a kind of fun, playful tone of voice. We always want to be writing with a smile, maybe literally. And what we're always trying to get across is this sense that it's fun to drive. And that's what's so great about many, and that's what's so great about us as people. So that's why I think it's really important when you come to define your tone of voice, your tone of voice, you actually don't call it your tone of voice. You call it your verbal guidelines, or as of course I would love it to be called your verbal identity guidelines. Because then you understand, and you help writers understand, that there's actually three levels that a voice works on. And that once you define each of those levels and make sure that they are consistent with each other and they reinforce each other, then your brand language becomes as distinctive as the outline of a Ferrari seen from a, a half a mile away or the bubble bubble of exhaust sound of a Mini that drives past you. Language can become in this way very malleable, very shapeable, very uh, quick to use, very easy to use, even quite cheap to use to get, to get your point of view across. And what it also means, I hope, is that if you're reviewing some writing with a writer, you don't have that horrible thing where you go, look, it's just not right, give it another go. Um, you're actually able to zoom in and say, look, your, your overview of who we are as a brand, your narrative is great, you know, that's fantastic. And even your tone of voice is great, but can you just stop using these particular words or writing in this kind of sentence? Because it's jarring with the rest of it. Or if you've got someone that's using all the right um, words, choices of jargon and things like that, um, and they get the tone of voice right, but they're writing about totally, they just don't seem to get it, they seem to be writing about totally the wrong thing. Spending some time walking them through the 10,000 foot narrative will really help them and really shape them. So everything that I really want to get across about language is that it should be considered, your brand language should be considered on three levels. Those levels must align or reinforce each other. And when you get that, you're helping a writer in that horrible moment at half past eight on a Thursday night when they're writing copy and they just don't know what you stand for. And you're helping yourself on Friday morning at 9.30 when you come to the copy and maybe it's right first time or maybe if something's not quite right with your brand language, it's really easy to kind of zoom in on it and say, your narrative is great, the nuts and bolts are great, but can you just change and be more playful, and when I say playful, I mean this, or everything is great, but can you just um, change some of the nuts and bolts? So that's why I think um, language is so great. That's why I think it's great also if you can change language by, uh, define language, excuse me, by looking at those three layers. And hopefully that makes your writer's life easier, and it makes your life easier as well. So thank you very much for listening to this part two by video. Um, I said I was going to ask a favour at the end. In fact, I've got two favours to ask. The first favour is a really, really big favour, and it's this. If you found parts one, part two today useful and interesting, please will you share with someone, one or two people outside your company, 
inside your network, friends, in wherever. Just share them uh, my details, say what today was about. And as I say, doing this over the next 12 weeks, 24 weeks, whatever it is, will help to keep me sane for sure. That's the first big favor. Second favor is if you would like to hear more about what we're doing, I send out a newsletter uh, every fortnight, twice a month. And you can sign up for that. If you email me, chris at verbalidentity.com, I'll sign you up. If you have comments or questions about today, I would really love to hear them, please. There may be a piece of copy that's always bugged you. There may be my signage in store that's never seemed right. And you just want to get a handle on how you can describe to your writers what it is you need to change. Um, please email me and I would love to answer your questions. And if you want to um, connect with me on LinkedIn, I think there's probably 10,000 Chris Wests in the world. But if you go onto LinkedIn, find Chris West uh, from Verbal Identity, that would be me and I'd love to connect with you there.